All right, and welcome everyone to Decred Assembly episode 20. Uh, today we have a very special guest. We have Chris from Placeholder Venture Capital, and we're really excited to talk through Decred and kind of how you guys got in the space, you know, what what crypto even is for for some of our viewers, and we're, we're really excited. So yeah, Chris, do you want to give a little introduction about yourself? Sure, and thanks for having me. Uh, my name is Chris Berniski. Uh, I'm a partner at Placeholder, which is a venture capital firm that specializes in decentralized information networks incentivized with the token. Um, and I got my start in the industry um, at ARK Investment Management, which became the first public fund manager to buy Bitcoin in 2015. Um, and I led the crypto effort there for a few years uh, before leaving in the middle of last year to found placeholder uh, with my partners, Joel Minegro and Brad Burnham. Great. And so and I guess I should say I wrote a book in the space. Um, yeah, so tell me a little bit about that. Um, well, I, I co-authored a book with uh, Jack Tater called Crypto Assets, The Innovative Investor's Guide to Bitcoin and Beyond. Um, I have talked about that book at length before, so I won't bore your listeners, but um, I mean, really the, the, the point of the book was to provide people a foundation to approaching crypto specifically um, as an investor because there had been prior books written about Bitcoin specifically or blockchain specifically, but at least at the time when we came up with the book idea, which was summer of 2016, um, there hadn't been a book to look at crypto as an asset class um, and very strongly felt that crypto was an asset class uh, had published a paper with Coinbase to that effect in the spring of 2016. And so we put in that proposal, got a book deal from McGraw-Hill, and then our timing was just really good. No one could have expected what 2017 uh, became uh, prior to the fact. And uh, so that book launched October of last year. Yeah, no, that's that's great to hear. And yeah, last year was a big year. This year is a big year. Uh, did I lose you? Yeah. Uh, I lost you for a second just okay. at the the big year. Yeah, but, no. So, but you can start over again. Yeah, I was just saying, as far as um, every year in crypto, it just seems to be building, and the 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 catalyst behind more people, more money getting into the space, and more people becoming knowledgeable is starting to show, which is exciting. And so, it sounds like your book and really your your company as a whole is in the right place at the right time. So that's that's neat. And now I, I did want to talk a little bit about the, the thesis that you guys had on your site as far as, you know, crypto and why it matters, why, why this is the next generation technology. Sure. Uh, and people can find that uh, thesis at placeholder.vc. Uh, we've got the file uploaded on IPFS, uh, so it won't be going anywhere. Um, really, if you put crypto in the context of information technology. Um, and I have to give a lot of credit to Brad and, and Joel for, for formulating this, this thesis. And um, I really just parrot it. Um, when you go back in time, there have been these different eras um, where value is captured. And then the value creation frontier tends to get commoditized and shift up the stack. Um, to the next value creation frontier. And to make this more tangible, if we go back really to the 40s, 50s, 60s, um, in that time of information technology, it was really the hardware era. And we had to build the bare metal um, and actually create that hard infrastructure to even have the, the backbone of IT that we have today. Um, and IBM famously captured uh, that market, that, that era, um, by vertically integrating everything um, and just having you know more salespeople and more machines and more um, talent than anyone else. Now, what undid a consolidating market uh, was really a standard. And that standard in 1971 was the creation of the microprocessor, which was a standardized piece of hardware, um, which allowed um, all of these different hardware manufacturers to start to piece together hardware at much lower cost than they could have prior, which allowed them to start to compete um, on fair ground with IBM. And so with this standardized unit of hardware, we started to see the costs um, of hardware creation collapse. Um, and really, 
that always enables a new value creation frontier on top of that, that collapsing cost structure. And so that's what gave birth um, to the software industry, which starts to rise in the 70s. Um, and again, just as happened with IBM, the software industry famously consolidated around Microsoft, uh, which was able to put more CDs on more shelves than anyone else, um, employ more developers, and therefore just push the, the, the software faster and in a proprietary setting. Um, and of course, it was also the lock-in contracts with the PC manufacturers. And it looked like um, you know, Microsoft had a death grip on the software industry really until new standards came out. And in this case, those standards were um, a standard around open source software collaboration um, and, and, and really exemplified by Linux. Um, and then a standard around information distribution, which was um, the backbone of the internet and, and the rise of the web. And so the, the open source software collaboration standard started to eat away at Microsoft's proprietary workforce. And then the information distribution standard uh, started to combat uh, Microsoft's reach, proprietary distribution. And so just as we saw with what the microprocessor did to hardware, these two new standards started to put pressure on software margins and the cost of software. And so again, as the, the, the cost of st software started to collapse, that gave birth to a new uh, value creation frontier, which leads us to the current era, which is really the data era. So the hardware was collapsing in costs, the software was collapsing in costs. And it's not to say that all of the value left hardware and software, it's more that the margin started to compress and those costs started to compress. And so now, when we look at the dominant companies, Google, Apple, Facebook, Amazon, Netflix, they're data aggregators and they either charge for access to proprietary data directly um, or provide a proprietary service based on proprietary data. And that is clearly a consolidating market just as IBM created a cons consolidating market and Microsoft created a consolidating market. And you can't fight those consolidators head on. Um, the only way to fight them as we've seen with past instances is to create this open standard that starts to eat away and commoditize the golden goose of the existing era. And this is where we think of blockchains or really these consensus systems as these open data layers. And they make data shared open and free. They collapse the costs of data distribution, data reconciliation, um, data consensus. And so we expect to see the data aggregation era start to be compressed in value uh, once again, unlocking this whole new frontier. And for us, um, that begs the question, well, what is the new monetization? What is the new golden goose within this new era if the hardware is open, if the software is open, if the data is open? Um, and Joel calls it governance. I call it coordination. Um, but it's really the same thing. It's really the, the value um, to coordinate these systems to create these economic goods and uh, the, the, these goods and services and the economic layers uh, that result. No, I, I appreciate that. And, you know, I think that's a, that's a good look and a good explanation of why we should be looking at crypto more and how it, how it truly will be scalable for that next consolidation. So, yeah, thanks for that. So I guess now the, the big question is, you know, this is the Decred assembly. How did you guys hear and find Decred? Well, that, that's a long story. Um, it actually goes back um, to, I think it was late 2016 or early 2017. Um, Charlie Lee uh, is the first person who ever made me aware um, of, of Decred. Um, I'm, I'm embarrassed to admit I, I didn't know about it prior to launch. Um, but he tweeted about uh, a few different assets that he was a fan of, um, such as Monero and Litecoin and Bitcoin, but the one that I didn't recognize was Decred. Um, and so that started to cause me to uh, look deeper into Decred because I do respect um, Charlie's talent. Um, and around that time, um, Willy Wu, who, who's been on Decred Assembly before, um, got in my ear about Decred as well. Um, and so. While Charlie Lee made me aware of the Decred rabbit hole, I would say it was Willie that dragged me down it, um, or at least made me fall in. Uh, and so I, um, 
developed personal interest um, and a personal position, uh, which uh, did very well. I did have to divest my my personal position when we raised placeholder because that's just our agreement with our limited partners. Um, I don't want to be conflicted about how I manage um, placeholders portfolio in the context of my own portfolio. So sadly, I don't personally hold Decred anymore. And that was um, one of, if not the most painful asset for me to have to divest from. Um, but then uh, having developed a lot of um, awareness and just an intellectual base around the way Decred functioned, it was one of the assets that we started looking into um, when we got placeholder off the ground and um, just continued to, to get to know the team and, and started to build a position. And that leads us to, to where we are today. No, that's, that's great to hear. And um, yeah, it makes sense as far as not having conflicting, uh, conflicting desires as far as where your personal assets and the, and the companies are. Yeah. Um, yeah. So let's talk a little bit about like the ICO approach and kind of how Decred's um, distribution was different. Did that stick out to you? It did. I mean, um, I was blown away when I understood how Decred launched um, because it's a, it's a great example of the magic of magic internet money. Um, this, this idea that, um, so for, for the listeners that aren't aware, right, Decred created 4% of its ultimate uh, 21 million supply right off the bat to airdrop to people, which it airdropped to about 3,000 people. And that immediately achieved uh, financial inclusion uh, mar and market liquidity. And with market liquidity, a price for the asset can be set. And that price for the asset is really based on the reputation of the developers and the plan going forward that allows you to create, say, a discounted expected utility value for the asset. Um, so that was 4%. Um, and again, kind of magically created out of thin air. Um, and another 4% was created and put into a dev fund. Um, and over time, that dev fund has been further capitalized by Decred's issuance model, where 10% where of the Coinbase reward goes into that dev fund. And now the dev fund um, is worth 40 or $50 million. It, it, it depends on the market price. You, you might yeah. know what it's worth today. Um, yeah, because for those of you guys who don't know, 60% of the block reward goes to the proof of work miners, 30% goes to the stakeholders, and then 10% goes to the development fund or you know, we're, we're working on renaming that because it doesn't uh, really adequately show what that fund is going to be because the neat thing is once Politea um, comes into the picture, we're going to be able to vote and the stakeholders are going to be able to have the say in how those funds are broken up, not just yeah. for development, which is neat. But, the network fund, it's really yep. the, the, the network's fund. And that, um, I mean, there were just so many things that felt right to me about that model. Um, because Decred didn't raise any money from investors, right? And no. and they actually self-funded it and dipped into that 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 um, development fund as little as possible because they understood the value of Decred. The market price of Decred at the time was very low, and so it would have depleted the funds. So there was sacrifice um, on the the core team's part, um, which you know is is shows their commitment, and then. The monetary policy is really interesting because if you think about these rules-based, um, time-consistent monetary policies, they set up this economic framework um, that promises to this, this decentralized set of agents, hey, if you come and contribute to this network, be it through the hardware and the ASICs that, that are coming online, the miners, or through the stakeholders that stake and vote and participate in governance, or the developers, those are, those are Decred's three big supply side actors, then there is this time consistent reward there um, for you to earn. And I think that's a um, much more nuanced and well thought out model than a lot of what we had seen prior. Um, and you know what shocked me is how um, early Decred was talking about these kinds of things really before a lot of these issues came to the forefront of say, um, mainstream crypto consciousness. Yeah, no, you're exactly right. And um, yeah, looking at one of the things, and we alluded to it a, a little before this, but the governance aspects of, of Decred specifically, I think, are one thing that makes it really unique. 
obviously that that was one thing that you commented on about this era that's coming up is just how are we going to compartmentalize and consolidate this technology and also be able to govern it well. And so what kind of stuck out? Because obviously we have Bitcoin, you know, Ethereum. Um, they have certain types of governance because we've seen changes on both of those networks. But Decred also has governance. What I guess we'll, let's talk a little bit about what Bitcoin, Ethereum does and what Decred does a little differently than, than all the rest. Yeah. Um, I think the most important place to start um, is every network, every system has governance, right? It's just sure. a matter of what that chosen governance is. And the choice of no governance is a form of governance. Um, and so I frequently get into that conversation um, with hardcore uh, Bitcoin maximalists, where Bitcoin has chosen a form of governance. Um, and while I understand the arguments for um, you know, having Bitcoin be a hard to change protocol and that actually allows it to be more stable and secure, which it needs to be to be a Bitcoin gold. And um, I understand that argument. I don't fully buy it um, because I think that you should have a optimal form of governance that allows for all stakeholders to be heard. Um, and if all stakeholders are heard and incorporated um, within a smartly designed rules-based system, then that system can incorporate new facts that allows that network to stay on track with providing the value that it has promised to provide for the world. And um, I feel like it's kind of a backwards justification to say, okay, we have this really sluggish form and, and um, tumultuous form of governance, and that's optimal. Um, it's pretty clearly not optimal. Um, and if you talk with a lot of people that are coming to the crypto space because we have to remember that it's still early, right? And the vast majority of people um, are still not involved with crypto. One of the first things they'll frequently talk about um, is all the drama around Bitcoin and the um, the issues with that, and you know the the concern that that uh, creates. And so this is where I think of uh, Decred, and 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 we'll see where this goes as Decred scales, but. Decred is, you know, all of the features of Bitcoin, but with none of the drama. Um, and so that feels like a very much upgraded system to me. Um, Ethereum has chosen something quite different, more um, inspired by what we saw with Linux um, and a benevolent dictator uh, in the form of Vitalik. And that has its own risks. Um, but right now is, is proving to work decently well. Um, I think that they will likely have to decentralize some of that um, as, as Ethereum grows, um, but it has allowed them to evolve, uh, say, at a faster rate than Bitcoin. Yeah. I, I mean, just looking at Ethereum alone, one of the things that sticks out to me that people are quick to forget was the fiasco with the DAO and just kind yeah. of the rolling back of the tapes. And, you know, there's just there's a lot of big decisions that were influenced by one person. And, and there's, I don't know, as, it, as this space continues to scale, it just doesn't really show a good equitable consensus. And it's like, yeah, it happened to be a, a good thing at the time for the majority of the holders. But at the end of the day, major changes like that, you know, you, it's going to be a lot harder to roll back the tape without a lot of uh, a lot of contention. Yeah, and that I mean that that was certainly a tough time for Ethereum. Um, I think that they went through a governance experiment, right? And we now have Ethereum Classic because of it, um, and that's that's a lesson learned. Um, and I don't, I I personally. Um, don't think of it as setting a precedent for that to continually happen in, in the future. I mean, there's a conversation now around the parity funds um, within Ethereum and just the, the amount of conversation around the parity issue, I think is, a, a, and the, the contention around it is a function of what happened with the DAO. So it's, it's showing the Ethereum community learning. Um, and there are Lane, Lane Retig, wrote a really good piece on Ethereum's governance that's that's worth reading, I think, to get kind of the the full picture. Because none of these systems are perfect, right? We're all learning. Um, and it's just going to be a matter of 
the truth wins out over time and, and the market will, will reveal that truth. Yeah, no, absolutely. So looking at Decred again specifically, you know, a lot of people ask the question, you know, what, what is Decred's function? Yeah, obviously it has a strong foundation in governance, you know, zoom, zooming out, looking at the other, the other projects, it really does things a little bit differently in regards to the stakeholders and the proof of work miners working together to reach a consensus, but ultimately the stakeholders having the final say, the people who have the skin in the game having the final say on what changes come to be. But would you say that that's Decred's, Decred alone's function is governance as a, as a, as a model of, you know, this is where the value is? I think it's too early to say sure. um, in, in terms of with Politea coming online shortly here um, and putting the network fund in, in the hands of the Politea de decision makers and the proposals that go in on, on how to use those funds and how to develop fu future functionality around Decred. Uh, what's really exciting is the network gets to decide. And I see, um, a number of different avenues, sort of parallel universes that Decred may walk, and it may walk some of them concurrently. Um, I think that there's certainly an argument to be made, um, like we were talking about a bit ago with Bitcoin, given that Decred supply um, is, is a curve similar to Bitcoin's, it's smooth, but it converges upon that fixed 21 million units over time. Um, given that supply curve, um, combined with upgraded governance and voice for the stakeholders, you could make the argument that Decred is one of the greatest threats um, to Bitcoin's pole position as digital gold or as a store of value, um, especially if Bitcoin um, alienates a lot of the people that support it and a lot of the broader institutions that say, okay, we just can't tolerate the fact that we have no voice at all here and we need a system where at least our voice will be heard and where there's more transparency around decision making. So say that's sort of universe number one, um, going after Bitcoin. Um, and that would be a, a flippening of a whole different sort. Um, so then there's uh, the whole private transaction route, right? And I don't think the market fully understands the importance um, and what it could mean for Decred to have privacy on par with the privacy coins. Um, and that opens up you know, a whole use case, both for store of value and um, means of exchange. And then there's really the general purpose governance front where other decentralized autonomous entities can run themselves on top of Decred and use this very robust multi-layer governance system, both for the recording and the enforcement of votes. And that is maybe the, the most intellectually exciting future um, for Decred, but also the one least defined as of now. But intuitively, it makes sense to me that um, there has been this proof of work system created for recording and tabulating votes, right? This proof of work, proof of stake system that's very robust, very secure. And so I can see a lot of um, applications building on top of Decred that need to run their organization through uh, basically leveraging this governance mechanism. So we'll see where that goes. You know, we'll see, I don't know, maybe Decred gets a VM um, at some point um, and, and that would change the game. There's um, the, the Rootstock guys, right, which are designing a VM for Bitcoin and um, Decred would potentially not be that far a leap away. Um, I know that there is conversation around, say, extending um, some of the scripting system, I think, with, with IndieCred to enable a bit more functionality. But it's kind of like I said at the start, too early to say, but the exciting thing is we all get to decide. Yeah, do you want to define what a VM is and why that would, why that would be relevant? Sure, so uh, VM is a virtual machine. Um, and so Ethereum really made this, this popular um, and what it allows for is basically uploading relatively simple logic um, into this decentralized world computer. That's basically what uh, a decentralized v VM becomes, which allows you um, to run programs that take certain inputs and push different outputs uh, that can trigger different kinds of actions. And while this sounds very abstract, these 
um, the, these logic waterfalls say are what create, you know, all of the, the uh, software based systems that we have today. So right now, still quite rudimentary. Um, but I think that there's an argument to be made that, you know, combining a VM with extremely strong governance, um, you know, which can pipe in to the VM as an input um, could get really interesting. Um, but, you know, that's not placeholders decision. That's really the community's decision. Yeah, no, that's neat. Thank you for uh, sharing that in a little more detail. Now, I think that leads into a, a good um, discussion about the, the DAO, you know, Obviously, there's been attempts in, in refer, referring to like what would a DAO look like in this space. Do you think Decred has the opportunity to become one of the first DAOs, decentralized autonomous organization? Yeah, well, the the network fund. I'm just going to keep calling it the network fund. But, yeah, uh, I like it. The 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 network fund will be that, um, and and Politea is really the um, say the 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 top layer the user-facing layer of um, governance than with the ticketing system as the enforcement layer. Um, and so what excites me is it's not an overly aggressive DAO in terms of like the functionality. Um, like it's not trying to do everything. It's not trying to create, say, an insurance corporation. Um, it, it is a big leap, right? And it is a big risk um, in terms of the the funds at stake but i think you know the uh what i really admire with how the decred team has worked towards this is um it's the there's this law gall's law which basically talks about all complex systems um started from sim simple systems that were then built up over time you can't start from scratch and build a complex system and hope that it works typically that ends up being trash and you have to go back and start with a very simple system and build it up over time and so the last few years for Decred, um, the team has been building, building, building towards this um, over two years now running in the wild, a lot of work even before the network launched in February of 2016. Um, and so I feel that this will be one of the um, first attempts at really a, a, a production DAO, right? There have been all kinds of experiments and sort of, um, uh, yeah, really experiments, not not so much a production system. And, and this will be one of our first looks at how that operates. Yeah, um, going into that a little bit, you know, with some of the exciting things that Decred is looking to accomplish, you know, simple payment verification is on the way, um, you know, privacy is on the way, Politea is right around the corner, um, and, and just a lot of exciting things happening in with this project. What do you think is a huge reason why people still don't know what Decred is. You know, it's been around for longer than a lot of the coins that are in, within the top 30, yet, you know, it still kind of staggers. Obviously, market capital is somewhat irrelevant, but I mean, it, at the same time, it, it, you know, it is where it is because it does have a lot of value. It is doing a lot of exciting things. What do you think are some of the big reasons why people don't know about the project? So a few things there, um, and it's one place where I hope I can help. Um, first off, I've noticed there's kind of, the, the, there are these generations of crypto projects, right? Um, where you, you go back um, and like a lot of people have never heard of, you know, Counterparty, say, um, because that happened too early, um, even though at the time that Counterparty launched on top of Bitcoin, um, that was a big deal and everyone knew about it. And so I feel like, um, you know, Bitcoin and what, I'll refer to, even though I don't really like the term, uh, the altcoin era, all the experiments that were close derivatives of Bitcoin, like Feathercoin and Litecoin and, and, and Namecoin and all those guys. That was sort of an era, and a, and, and a few coins achieved escape velocity, escape velocity from that era. Um, and that was certainly most notably, no, most notably Bitcoin and Litecoin. And then there's kind of this second era where I would put Decred um, where there are coins that evolved with significant learnings and significant deviations um, from 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 Bitcoin, such that they almost um, they they're very distant relatives, right? And that era was still pre the the mainstream rush. Even even 2013 was not a mainstream rush 
in comparison to what 2017 was, right? And so projects, and that really, I would say, ended with, with the end of 2016. And then 2017 is this new era where you had the vast majority of people come online and a lot of awareness. And so projects that launched in 2017 that were you know, quite flashy, gathered a lot of attention, they might still have momentum from that attention. Um, but execution is going to expose, I think, a lot of projects here. Um, and so I think for Decred, you know, it's it's really the long day, long game. It's just building, building with the building, awareness grows. So I'm not I'm not concerned, even though I I am aware of say this progression and, and how it's worked um, to to emphasize other coins that may not be as deserving as Decred first. Um, but again, the the truth will win out. I think another consideration is. Um, a lot of the people involved in, in Decred are really sharp, um, but quite nerdy, right? And, and, and we, love, um, we love the details, um, but the details may not be relevant to most people. And so I think we have to find ways to um, communicate Decred to different audiences, right? There's say the retail, and, um, investor audience or the institutional investor audience. And those are two different audiences. There's the developer audience, um, which you know really does nerd out on the technical details. Um, there, hopefully in the future will be say less, maybe I, I should have said the engineer audience and differentiated that from more the, the, the DAP developer or people that will build on top of Decred. And so I think we have to simplify the, the, the messaging to, to get people in and to get them to understand um, a good analogy to use here is how viruses work. Um, viruses first attach to their host because they kind of look familiar, right? And and they trick the host because there's some familiarity there that 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 allows the virus to atta attach. And then they inject the new DNA, the new stuff. And so I think that um, as as much as Decred is doing new, exciting. Kind of radical things. We we need to context, uh, contextualize it a little bit uh, using things like, well, this you basically uh, this is not um, the full picture, but you can say things like, this is Bitcoin, but with governance, um, or you can say things um, like I said earlier, you know, you get all of the features, but with none of the drama, and really to contextualize it in people's understanding of what came before it. Um, to allow them to understand how how this is different and and how this is important. Yeah, no, I, I appreciate that. I, I think that's something that a lot of people, especially people who've been with the project a long time, sometimes struggle with. And people who are just seeing the name starting to pop up are kind of wondering, it's like, well, where did this thing come from? And it just kind of helps you understand a little bit what why Decred is kind of where it is, and I think where it's going, which is yeah. which is exciting. Um, but let's talk a little bit about the decentralized exchange. I don't know if you got a chance to read uh, Jake's initial proposal, but what are your thoughts there? Is, is that something that you think would prov provide a good value proposition? Yeah, and you know, I think of it as a decentralized atomic swap exchange, right? And it's, it's quite a different yeah. approach um, from some of the other attempts at DEXs that we've seen. What I particularly like about it is it empowers projects to build um, the, uh, and, and to integrate into Decred, right? It truly is a permissionless system. Um, and it, it allows um, anyone, and it's, it's, it's not just, say, an ERC-20 um, also to, to link in. And so I think that opens itself up um, to the broader ecosystem and allows us to uh, move away from some of the cabal um, that centralized exchanges have become, um, and some of the, you know, borderline extortionist fees, and it's just it's become such a sort of political and fiscal nightmare um, to get listed on these centralized exchanges. And so um, I think this is a really interesting approach, um, and it certainly fits within um, a, a sector within crypto that is going through, you know, really rapid growth right now. Yeah, no, I think you're, you're dead on right there. Um, 
I mean, let's ask the dirty, nasty question. What, what kind of a, what kind of a threat do you think something like a project like Tesos is? Obviously, it's been around for a little bit now. Hasn't actually come live. There's been rumors about what's going on there. Do you think there's any kind of issue of Tesos coming in and doing something that Decred is doing differently and taking a lot of that value proposition it's been bringing? Well, I think that um, if if and when and or when Tezos launches, um, it will be very uh, it it will be one of Decred's closest competitors. Um, but there are quite a few things that are different, um, and I think the the ethos is quite different, right? Tezos clearly has a lot of funds, um, and so they do have resources to um, buy potentially their way to success with certain things. Um, I mean, what's going to ultimately happen with those funds and um, you know the whispers that you hear? I don't want to give credence to any of those things because I just don't know. And you know, I talk with um, Kathleen whenever I see her, and she's a great person. You know, she's like they. Um, I think they 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 wrote back in the day a crisp white paper that I thought was quite good. And um, even though Decred. I would say had been focusing on a lot of these issues longer than Tezos. Tezos did a good job also of articulating them. And Tezos got a little caught um, in the frenzy of 2017. Um, and that may work to their, their disfavor. I think it's with the, the key for both Tezos and Decred is that people build on top of them and people use them. And I think it's very hard to buy your way into the, the, the hearts of developers and engineers. And you more have to either earn your way or let the engineers and developers earn their way into your system. And this is where just being around, being, being an operating system really works to Decred's favor because one of the things I really like about Decred is the developer ecosystem is growing, right? People are coming, people are migrating um, to Decred and that's what you wanna see it's really this emerging economy, this emerging nation that's very vibrant. And so Tezos will really kind of have to start, um, not from scratch because they, they have built a community, but they have a lot to prove um, and a lot to build relative to you know, what Decred has had up and running for over two years now. Great, yeah, no, I appreciate you comments on that because I know a lot of people who are involved with both projects, you know, are, are kind of curious. And so I, I was just kind of interested to get your viewpoint on that. Um, but yeah, I mean, looking at Decred, are there anything, any things about the project that you'd like to comment on as we kind of come to a close? Well, I think I, I, I personally am very excited to participate um, in, in the Politea proposal process and I think um, I, you know, want to encourage anyone who's watching this to get involved as well because there are not that many projects where you, as a stakeholder, have a direct voice um, in how the the network is governed. Um, and I think a lot of people generally are just, and this goes outside of crypto, are kind of jaded. They're kind of fed up with how different governance systems work, right? And um, I was just reading this academic paper on the US system that um, on, on the American voting system. And it's basically there's the, the average retail just voter has a near zero impact on the outcome of situations um, it, compared to the whole lobbying um, arm and, and really what has become the political machine. And so with Decred, um, the, the mission goes beyond, say, this um, autonomous cryptocurrency or platform for decentralized autonomous entities, and it's really a new governance platform. Um, and so I think that is a very noble, um, important experiment that goes beyond crypto. And so um, having people get actively involved um, is important to the success of Decred, right? Like we are sure. the ones um, that, that make the network. Um, so I think that's, you know, what's, what's kind of on my mind, um, all the time, 
with with Decred, and we just have to keep our heads down and keep building. Yeah, no, absolutely. And then one quick question in regards to you know people sit people say in the governance aspect that you just touched on, what do, what about delegated proof of stake? That's something that's been coming up quite a bit. Would you be able to speak into that at all, and, and kind of some some issues that are involved there? Yeah. So delegated proof of stakes been around for a long time, um, and it's really this idea a proof of stake based system, but you as a holder of the asset can delegate your weight, your votes to these centralized nodes or points that presumably are educated voters that do this all the time. Um, and it really compromises some on the decentralization for hopefully the benefits of scalability. And this is really coming to the forefront again in conversation because of EOS, right? Um, and everyone um, and, and anticipating what's going to go on with EOS. I think, um, you know, like when Steemit launched in the middle of 2016, that was really exciting to see delegated proof of stake in the wild. And while people have been um, iterating on it and improving it, and there's lots of examples out there, LISC is another one, um, it does lead to pretty strong centralization. Um, and really incentivizes strong centralization, which scares me. Um, and I think long term, it's 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 kind of a it's a pessimistic bet um, against the fact that we won't be able to figure out how to scale and create performant decentralization. And to me, that's a technology problem. And we, while I'm not an engineer, and so I speak a little bit out of place here, but as a student of um, the, the history of innovation, um, we as, as a species always find ways to solve these technology problems. And um, so long as we continue to aspire and work at those problems, we solve them. The key is that we don't give up on them. And I feel like DPoS is a little bit of giving up prematurely. Um, and I think it's potentially a pragmatic approach in the short to medium term here. Um, but I don't think it's the end solution longer term. Yeah, no, I agree. I think having a, a way for proof of stake and proof of work to work together to have the security aspects, but also the, um, the equitable consensus that comes with that and having the stakeholders be able to have the skin in the game really does, I think, allude to something that will be scalable and making sure that the changes that keep on building really do come from the people that are involved and care about the project. And so... And that's Decred. Yeah, and that's Decred. Well, Chris, thank you so much for your time. Um, yeah, we really appreciate it and we're excited to hear uh, more from you guys just as you continue speaking to the project. Um, yeah, everyone who's tuning in, please keep uh, your eyes open. We're going to try to have some more, uh, <laughs> some more regular episodes. It's been a couple months. And so we're excited about the project. And again, thank you for your support. Just like Chris said, uh, check out the Slack, decred.slack.com. Um, check out our website, decred.org. Um, again, you know, there's lots of ways to get involved. Again, just take a look. Look into the project. It's exciting what's, what's happening in this space. And yeah, thanks again for viewing. Thanks, Trace. See ya.